Welcome to the Nordic Mythology Podcast. I'm Daniel Farron, Connor Company Horns Voting, and I'm joined once again by my co-host Matthias Nordvig. Unfortunately, he missed last week and he's back. So welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's great to be back. Um, yeah, it's been a couple of uh, interesting weeks, but uh, finally got everything settled. And uh, I am back once again to bestow my wisdom on all of you. And this time we are joined by Arnas Ferravicius, um, the very famous actor who is apparently impressed at, uh, of my <laughs> pronunciation of his name. Uh, you hopefully know him as Citric from uh, The Last Kingdom. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, everyone. I, again, once again, I apologize for uh, taking my time to showing up. Uh, here I am. <laughs> I appreciate you being here. I'm, we got I, I want to let everyone know I'm, I'm here as a student. I'm just preparing everyone. I'm, more, I'm a student here. So <laughs> We are, you know, you're welcome. Uh, Mateus teaches everybody. We're all students of him, I feel, every single week. Uh, yeah, I'm glad we we finally made this happen. You know, we've we've booked it, unbooked it, moved it. We've been speaking about it for maybe like a year now. <laughs> yeah, but the fact I feel like uh, also we've we've so, sort of been in communication for, for for how long now? What two three years? Also, by the way, Horns of Odin. Like that's that's Ooh. when I first met you. Years. You know, this ago. is why this is why you're my favorite out of the show. <laughs> say <it> right now. <laughs> quick plug. Always good with a quick plug. So unless, just, unless Alex just popped up. And we have so much, and you've sent a, sent both me and Alex uh, and other Last Kingdom members such cool stuff over the years. So it's just nice to find him. Like, who is that man that keeps sending these amazing? <laughs> that, that weird man who just sends stuff. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Hopefully, I don't have that reputation. No. <laughs> no. no. I'm like, oh my god, where's the have you where's the package? Have I received the package yet? No, it's not. So we're constantly waiting. <laughs> so that's what your life is about, just waiting for packets oh, from for points sure. of May, May. I'm like, I, every time I was on Last Kingdom, I'd be like, I'd turn up the set and like, oh nice, we need you to make up. Like, yeah, 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 makeup. Is the package here yet? <laughs> and, <laughs> is it here yet? I'm like, what package? What package? And then you know, for a couple of weeks pass, and then here you have it. Boom. <laughs> it looks good. It thank looks you good. Very much. Thank you. <laughs> It suits you. Um, no, thank you very much. I mean, like I said, people are going to know you from a Citric from The Last Kingdom. Uh, I finished it yesterday. The, oh, is it good? I haven't, stand, I haven't had time yet. I mean, whew, I didn't have a dry eye of, a dry eye for an episode. Oh, that's... I was, it, it got me. Mate, it definitely got me. Is your carbon monoxide meter okay? Because you might be, there might be gas in your... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... Um, yeah, I, I think the show got better and better as the seasons progressed. I enjoy I enjoyed it from the start, but it just seems to have improved like a like a Rolling Stone, just getting bigger and better. Maybe not a Rolling Stone, like a snowball. Mm. You know, like a snowball, just getting bigger and better as it goes on. Um, um, the Rolling to the Stone, last, if the Rolling Stone kind of crashes something, everything in, in front of it. So it's, it's also good. Sorry. <laughs> exactly um yeah it just seems to have got bigger and, and until it's just become this powerhouse you, you, you know you're hitting top the top spot on netflix the biggest show in you know in the world on there it's coming up as number one it's trending here there and everywhere you're all just turning to superstars i think did you ever expect that when you because did you come in in season two three mm. yeah season two i um it's a very uh, I think surreal ride for all of us because especially this this when this season five came out because we were at the time we we're shooting the movie that you probably I don't know if you heard of uh, so we're doing the Last Kingdom like a special and as this the season came out we were sort of working at the time so it's just this surreal thing because you're doing the thing and then it's coming out but you're not really thinking about it and all of a sudden people are like yeah yeah it's great and you're like oh. So it's fascinating mm -hmm. how over the years um, it has become what it has, and I don't think I don't think any of us expected it because we just I mean I, don't, I think everybody was just trying to do the best job they can and help each other out as much as we can, and and I guess this this result that it seems so nice uh, ultimately feels like just a side effect, like a byproduct of us trying to mm -hmm. you know, do something meaningful, hopefully. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think. That I, for me, that's a 
I love to hear that because I think the the one of the major things as to why it's been so success, so successful is the is the clear bond between actors and characters, and I think it screams on the on the screen when the when the show comes out. But you all seem to get on so well, particularly so obviously you, Alex, and Mark Rowley. Um, you seem to have a really close bond. You. Anybody who follows your Instagrams quite clearly see you all play jokes on each other, pranks, and, and there seems to be a genuine care for each other. And that it's all so obvious when when the, the show comes out. Oh man, thank you so much, man. I mean, that really, really means a lot because um, I think at season three we clicked, we we caught that feeling, and we're like, wait a minute, this is we have to you know be about each other, and um, it's just nice that you know people sort of notice that. But ultimately, I think. When we finished shooting the movie, somebody asked, like, why is this show? Why do people love it so much? Why do people love working on it? Because not only do people, it's it's been very successful, for which we're very grateful, but there's this constant atmosphere on set throughout the years that everybody just loves being there. You know, all the actors, mm-hmm. all the crew members, and we all match. And, and I and we were wondering what's the what's the secret sauce that mm-hmm. makes it that? And um I sort of try to break it down. And I think we've come to the conclusion that the only constant throughout all these seasons is Alex. You know, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of things change. We had producers are always the same. Some of the directors change this and that changes, but there's one constant throughout the thing that is just constantly good and nice to everyone. And it's trying to create this atmosphere. And I think it's, uh, it's a huge testament to what an amazing number one Alex is. And he just taught us all that there's a way to make a set and a show involve that involved everyone. Mm-hmm. And I think that energy from him trickled down onto the rest of us. And I think that's one of the sole reasons why we have that brotherhood. Because mm-hmm. we his his demeanor towards everyone when I first met him, I was like, wait, how is he so nice to everyone? Mm-hmm. And I think partly because of that we sort of just like, we want to do good. So I think, yeah. Yeah. That's pretty I cool. Think, like, you know, having having a, a lead that actually leads in that way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think I remember that's the, that's, this is a bit cheesy maybe, but that's one of the last things I said to Alex when we finished the shooting, the, the entire thing. I remember I, um, I don't know, there was emotions and whatever. But at one point, I remember I just hugged him and I said, you're, you're a very good leader. And I never... Uh, I never planned to say that, but I remember when I, when that moment happened and yes, we're all actors. We're, this is all an ensemble. There's nobody's higher than the other person, but there is the sense of a leader. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he's an amazing leader. Mm-hmm. You know, I, he's, he's, he, he comes across a very nice guy. And I know when I've had any interaction with him, he's, he, he really does seem to be one of the, the good people out there. But, but I mean, so do you all, you've all been very, very kind um, to me whenever, you know, I've spoken to you, but with, with Alex in particular, I, I think the first time I met him, I made him a horn at a Comic-Con and mm-hmm. it was just a, a thing. I just made it, I made it and, and asked them to give it to him and, and that was it. I didn't expect anything from it. And then an hour later, I see somebody wheeling themselves over um, in a, you know, in a wheelchair coming my, coming my direction of people staring over and, uh, you know, once he gets close, I'm like, fuck, that's, that's Alex. You know, it's Alex under German. This is a weird thing. Um, and, you know, if you've ever been to Excel Center, it's a big, it's a big place. And this guy wheeled himself from one end to the other with a, with a torn ACL just to come and say thank you for, for a present that I gave him. And I, you know, I've been lucky enough to, to make horns for some, you know, pretty cool people. But usually, like, no one's ever given that, that kind of reception like, you know, taking the time to come over, say thank you. And, and you know, I said, he didn't have it with him. So they looked, do you mind sending me a picture with it later? Give him my email address. As soon as like, literally an hour later, he must have got back to his hotel room, took a picture, sent it. And it's like that care and understanding for, you know, that he knew that that meant something to me. Um, and it was that kind of empathy and understanding that it meant to me. And it was special to see because a lot of people kind of when they get up, up there, maybe forget that. Um, so yeah i i definitely reiterate what you say i think he's uh in a way um 
he's sort of confirming something quite biblical. I mean, there's probably other other uh, sources that would talk about that, but he, I don't know, just has a podcast about Alex, just to never- <laughs> I know, we need to we just change. <laughs> he never shows favoritism. And that's, that's one of the, I haven't read other, you know, uh, other sources of, of, of religion and, 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 and books. So I've, I've only explored a little bit of Bible at this point. And that, that really popped when, when I read that, I was like, oh, that's, and there's even a joke within me that in terms of behaving with people, cause I'm hyper. So I, I, I when I first started, <laughs> I, could, I could be like <laughs> impulsive and like say something and then only then think about what I said. And that's just the tendency that I would have. And uh, over time, spending time with Alex, I, I've developed this this form like, what would Alex do? Before I do, <laughs> before certain interactions, I would like I would call him like, what would you do? Oh, okay, so I've uh, I think I definitely uh, yeah enough about him. But I, I, <laughs> after I, this podcast, hey, we'll have stories about how he walks in the water. WWAD <laughs> James, <laughs> like, what that, yeah. Oh, what would God. Alex do? Oh my I God, mean, let's make this a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I feel like I'd probably do that with Mateus to not give him too much credit. What would Mateus do? And then realize I don't have the knowledge, so <laughs> I just have to do what I need oh, to do. Oh shit, you, you don't want to do what I do. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just interesting how, how how behaviors like that they trickle down and everyone it's infectious. Huh? Yeah, it's, it's infectious. infectious. Exactly. And it's 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 such a cheap thing to do. Just be present with people as much as you can you know yeah. it's not that's it's, that's the thing though it's not it's not hard to do it's not hard to just be nice to people to listen to people and to 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 think about how they may feel but so few people actually do it and and are conscious about doing it as well yeah but it's not necessarily i don't think it's necessarily a negative thing that some people were like i don't think a lot of people do it out of malice some people no. might but i think it's more of a I think it's just a question of awareness of oneself that you over either develop over time or you know, who said that the examined life is worth living. I don't know. One of them famous ones. Mateus, do you know? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I think it would be Rene Descartes, Descartes, Descartes. I don't know. I'm just. Oh, um, Descartes. Yeah, could be. Yeah. Be, I don't know. One of them big ones, the big boys. <laughs> <laughs> just you, you just say who you think it is and we'll back you. And then we'll. <laughs> That's that, how it works. That's how 2022 works. Fact check? No, I said it's a fact. Yeah, that's who it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I think one thing I, I like about the show is that it doesn't always take itself too seriously. Oh, yeah. um, and do you, is that something you think they, they put in on purpose and you guys are, are very much aware of? Huh, that's a good question. I don't, I think we, and I'm, this is a compliment to Mark now because he's been pushing this agenda that we need the banter. We need to, mm -hmm. because these are men uh, and women that go to battle and they constantly you can die. You can always die. And as far as we've read about history in terms of, in times of war, the sense of humor really goes up because you're constantly dealing with like, well, this might be the last moment ever. Mm -hmm. So I think some of it was written and the writers did a great job, but I think, it's it's more I I would say it's on on Team Utrecht and Mark uh, to keep pushing the agenda. That's some of the some of the banter within. A lot of the stuff over the season has been written more and more. And I think mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with you that it's not taking itself too serious. Is just it doesn't it doesn't add any charm. I think I think I I agree with that. I I I love it when people don't take themselves too seriously. I try to apply that. To my to my own life in general, um, right. yeah. But it's, take it's, yourself too seriously. <laughs> but it's hard. It's it's hard not to. Some I mean, I guess whatever ego or something. But it's 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 one thing that another thing that this show taught me is that like this we're not come on we're not saving lives. Let's <laughs> do the best we can. Do the best we can and have fun with it at the same time. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, and that comes across. And it for me it speaks volumes because I I think when whenever anybody does anything about this time period, it's particularly Vikings in particular, it can soon fall into that super serious, macho kind right. of warrior thing. Thank and, you. and other, there's the other 
TV show that maybe we're not going to mention. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, but the other one, like there are other ones that they, they have. Everything feels like it's got a dark gloom over it. Everything's filmed almost like it's got a, a filter on it, and and there's a lot of dark makeup and and yeah. it just all feels so heavy. Whereas I think The Last Kingdom is so successful because it it has those light moments, but it also has these quite difficult, horrific, saddening moments. But you get the contrast, which makes you also care and have the emotions. Mm, that's very interesting. I think I agree with you because it. I think there's this duality in life that mm -hmm. you know, suffering or being happy or whatever. It's there's always that's always on a little bit of a pendulum, but you can't have one constantly. I think. So I think playing around with this is just, I don't know, it's, it, it just makes it nicer for all of us. I mean, it's, it, it's, I think in that sense, it's, it, it's great when popular uh, media teaches people lessons of these kinds. Uh, yes. I feel you could, you could say that, you know, for a very long time in the Western world, it feels like we have, we have just been on the up and up. And we've been thinking that everything is just going to be fine. And, and as long as we just like keep partying, really. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, the, these last couple of years, we, we're all we're standing there and it's like, wait, wait, life can suck, too. Yeah. And I think a lot of people have have had like a hard awakening with that. Like, but it's 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 terrible that it, uh, sadly it, it takes us humans to always experience a, a terrible historical event of some sort to come to understanding these things, but um you know it's at least we 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 still learn I guess. I think you know it depends on the stories that we tell. If we if we tell stories that also include the tragedies, like that's what the ancient Greeks did, right? That they, they they had comedies, they had tragedies, right? And and we've sort of forgotten about the tragedies in in our cultures these days. Because it seems like we tend to really focus, I think, we tend to focus on the happiness aspect of life, mm -hmm. right? Which is like the other side. It's just a fleeting moment, isn't it? It so, can be, yes. So it's, if we constantly focus on that, you know. And another thing I love what you touched upon, Dan, previously is that that usually there's a tendency for these kind of shows to show this like hyper alpha type of behavior which is not really even i think not really even natural in in you know in the world so what i find fascinating and thank you for touching on that is that there's there's a lot more vulnerability in this show i think mm -hmm. there's a lot of it that is i don't know but a lot more it's not a competition but what you said it's 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 fun and sometimes it's difficult i remember mm -hmm. for, for me the personally was watching can't remember what season, but after watching that season, I was like, wow, Alex, it's tough being Uhtred, man. It looks like it's it's tough. And I think that's... Uh, yeah. I, I, I agree with that. I, I, I really enjoy that there is vulnerability in these stories as well. Um, it, because you don't see that quite often with this time period, first of all. And secondly, when there's Vikings involved, it's always some macho dick swinging stuff. And it's like, come on, guys. Why? Like, Why? Yeah, I mean, we, we need the whole range of human emotion, if you ask me, when we portray people, because we know that that existed. Otherwise, we're just going to like box them up in a, in a stereotype and, and, and end up with that. Because we're still, still like human beings, right? Right. History changes, but the, 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 the conditioning here and the pathways are like, they're still pretty much the same ish, I think. Yeah. What about, what about the, women in viking cultures because i feel like that's perhaps that's being a bit explored a bit more but i've i don't know if it's right i've heard that there's a lot more power from um from uh, viking women that we tend to historically talk about oh honest, right? you're, you're about to unleash something here <laughs> let's go down the rabbit hole this, okay. is, this is your first experience of a Matthias nordvig uh <laughs> lecture time <laughs> okay I, i'm because i don't know anything i'm just in there <laughs> got a pen looking right like you're ready to make notes as well <laughs> so so the thing is um you know when we talk about like this the, these ideas of like being free and not free um in a modern context that of course those concepts were entirely different back then right um arguably the the, the thing that was considered freedom in the Viking age in, in Scandinavia would be family. 
So that's very different from how we think about freedom today. Like freedom is something for the individual. Uh, I can go do my own thing and so on. But back then, uh, your freedom was guaranteed through your family. So the, the more power your family has, the more freedom you have as an individual. So that means if you're a woman who belongs to a high status family, right, that has money, power, a lot of swords, then you would have a lot of freedom. Um, but then as you go down the, the ranks of, of, of uh, social hierarchy, then you probably get less and less freedom. Now, um, some of the things that we usually focus on in, in modern society is like things that, that give women freedom. Um, say, for instance, sexual freedom. Uh, can, can you have extramarital sex or uh, how does that work out? It does seem like they, they were probably less restrictive about those kinds of things. Mm. Um, what about social mobility? Well, social mobility was probably very constricted based simply off of the fact that it was a steep hierarchy that we had in, in the Viking Age, um, probably also before. Do we see uh, women being basically, quote unquote, sold off into marriage uh, with dowries and all that stuff? Yeah, that happens all the time, it looks like. That's the standard in the saga literature from medieval Iceland. Of course, that's medieval Iceland, so we don't know exactly if that applies to the Viking Age. Right. Could a woman say no in those uh, those contexts? Probably not so much. Right. But um, we could also turn it around and ask yourself: Well, did did anybody care if a low status woman, like uh, somebody who belonged not to the slaves but uh, to to just above the tenant peasants, mm -hmm. it, did they care who she had children with? Maybe not. Right. So 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 a woman of that. Uh, that um, level of society might actually have freedoms in a certain way over there in terms of who she chooses to 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 marry and, and such things. Um, do we see women entering trades? Uh, that's a really good question. That actually it's really difficult to say because what the what we really have to base this on is is archaeological evidence and doesn't look like you know that you have women blacksmiths or something like that that doesn't seem to appear but then on the other hand as we've shown over the last 10 years or more um there are like warrior graves that where the individuals seem to be women right so, that's, that's the one that i was wondering interested about yeah. yeah and so so you have you have what appears to be female warriors in the Viking Age. Also, you have very distinctive female leaders of various kinds, both um, what we could call priestesses or, or something like that, and, and what we could call queens as well. So like, is priestesses something to do with the higher knowledge of... Yeah, okay. absolutely, right? So, so um, it's actually a Polish researcher, Letzia Gardiela, uh, who has uh, uh, worked on this... Um, uh, these these female graves where uh, the women are buried in very fine clothing, and then they have all these interesting weird objects with them. Like um, there's one grave from Denmark, for instance, where she, uh, that's one of my favorites, um, a very famous one, where she is buried with uh, a pouch with like a, like standard like witch stuff like owl's vomit and a mouse skeleton <laughs> like that random <laughs> stuff that she used for like probably magic uh, potions or something like that and and she is also buried with a staff which is a very common theme too in the mythology we have like this vulva who is a staff bearing uh a prophetess of some kind um so so like those those graves appear from in the viking age and they are you know, they, these are women of high status. We can see that they're buried in, in fine clothing with special items, some things that come like from far away. The, the Danish grave that I mentioned, she has chalice that comes from Kazakhstan. So very far away, right? <laughs> traded all the way through uh, the Eurasian continent, basically. So that would be a very important object. And, and so, so what you can see is that you have these like high status roles for women, um, 
another great example of a very special grave is the Oseberg ship. Um, one of the most uh, impressive uh, graves that we have from the Viking Age is ship burial that was probably co covered, for, like half of it was covered for about six months. The other half was standing outside okay. of the grave. Um, there are two women buried in it. Okay. And they have, scholars have debated for ages, what is the relationship between the two women? Was one a queen, the other one a slave or like, and we don't know. But what we can see is that two women have been buried in what, what is one of the most elaborate ship burials in Scandinavian history. Mm -hmm. And there's like sacrificed horses, beautiful carvings, um, all kinds of items and so on. So obviously what this signals is that in the 800s when this grave was made, these women were considered incredibly important in society. Right. So, so we have all of that evidence that tells us that obviously that, that the women could have, you know, pretty high status in society for different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but did that status come with the same kind of freedom that we think of today? Probably not. But you probably... can say yourself that the understanding of freedom, it was a very different, like, concept at the time. Yeah, right. absolutely. So, so it's a little bit give and take when we talk about like, could women be free or were women free well, or? Is it then safe to say that a lot of this historical analysis could be um, uh, sometimes is done through a very um, modern lens, like lens perspective? Mm -hmm. Okay. Absolutely. So th this, is, this is always our problem, right? We, we don't fully understand some distant uh, historical period because we live in our own modern context and we have only inherited so much of their thinking that we can sort of relate to it, if that makes sense. Um, and so that, that means then that it's always dangerous to say, uh, to basically transpose your current values to the past, right? Yeah, that is fascinating. <laughs> I, I, honest, I, I now know what I look like all those episodes ago when Mateus used to tell me all these stuff. Uh, you know what? Once I once you said that is a good question, I'm like, oh my god! <laughs> wow. I, I saw you. You leaned forward. It's, yeah, you know, I, you, I you, felt your, it. I, your eyes widened. It's like, <laughs> but it, <laughs> it's good to see. But it's nice to see you that you have a, a genuine interest as well because no, this is the you what you said is very fascinating and I, I don't think i thought about it this this way i i thought about it a little bit that we tend to uh look at history from today but how certain concepts must have been completely different in the history and we i don't know we can interpret them one way or another but it's so beyond our understanding if we don't have the like the the actual wisdom of the zeitgeist of the time and what people were thinking and how are they thinking right right yeah and you know it's it's um it, this is also why it's it's so problematic when we as modern people say well they used to do this in the past so therefore it should make sense that we do it now it's like no no, that's not how it works <laughs> because we, we don't know their motivations or the, the basis on which they did these things and why and, and all of that stuff. So, so like, it's, it's, it's really problematic to get caught up in that idea, I think. I have a question then. What do you think, like looking at all the historical um, research that you've done and looking into the future, what would be the way for us humans of a specific time to leave information for the future people that they would would not misinterpret it. How can you make it like? Because I imagine even the the scholar are the, the documents, the the fossils you find, they still have a little bit like well, uh, even the text that could be missing subtext or whatever because it's just this in detail. So I, it was interesting. What would you think would be the way? So send... are you trying to take my job? <laughs> Hey, mate, I dressed up as you, so listen. You're wearing my clothes, asking my questions. I need a big beard, beard the only thing is like, I don't have enough. I don't have enough hormones to grow a beard. So <laughs> okay, so this is actually a really, really interesting question because, as we can see in the modern age, you can uh, document your opinion uh, pretty, pretty concisely in uh, 
with the like what we're doing right with this podcast or you can do it on youtube with like video and everything and people will still misinterpret in the con mm -hmm. contemporary times right like right. people yeah. will willfully misrepresent what you said in in various ways right uh, no matter how clearly you state your opinion so so if people can do that right now people who presumably understand the entire social context for our existence right now the political context uh, where we are who we come from and all that stuff right and still people will misinterpret it or misrepresent it so that will happen too in the uh, in the future i don't are think we, that we can are we coming back is this is this somehow sorry dan is this leading right. toward towards the babel 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 tower that that probably like, <laughs> because like because it seems that seems to me that all these different languages that we have and then we send these whatever leave remains into the future then we translate them and there's constantly some nuance that you can't translate right yeah but it's also a work in progress where i think we're actually all going in the same direction more and more because just think about it right now we're a danish guy who lives in uh, the us we are a lithuanian guy who kind of lives in london and we're a british guy who, <laughs> who lives up in yorkshire sitting here uh yeah. sharing uh information with one another right so so that that's not something that you would find on a regular basis uh, 70 years ago or 100 years ago right mm -hmm. so so there is i think there's hope if you know what i mean like we've we've come pretty far as as a species making this possible and on this podcast, we've had people from from Russia. We've had people from the U.S. We've had people from um, Germany. We've had people from all kinds of places, right? And that kind of gives me hope, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. but it, uh, one thing I wanted to to highlight is actually your question here about like how do we accurately uh, ensure that information stays, uh, you know, uh, consistent from now and way into the future. That's actually a problem that um, nuclear scientists are working on because we oh, have- Of course all of he has an answer like this. <laughs> of course he knows. Okay. <laughs> no, think about it. Like we have all of these sites around the world where we have uh, performed uh, nuclear tests, right? And so what that means, uh, for instance, if it's, if it's underground uh, locations, what that means is that there is going to be a radioactive glass cave um, it, it, that will <laughs> persist for, for like thousands of years, maybe even millions of years, right? right? That future humans could find after our civilization may, may have like disappeared and wow. they wouldn't know what it is. So, so scientists have been working on how do we manage to tell people in the future that this is a dangerous place like how do we encode information for the future about that and that's i think it's just wild to think about it's like we don't even know if the languages that we speak are going to exist five thousand years from now we don't know if the technology that we have is going to be there we don't know anything about how we can record this but scientists are trying to do that. And that that is that freaking blows my mind. <laughs> it's fascinating. I think our minds have both just both just been blown as well. Right. <laughs> but I was also, a... as you were saying, I was also interested thinking of like, wow, so these radioactive spots also in themselves tell a story. If if, for example, the future, whatever generation, some 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 has some sort of a Geiger counter of something, they can already it's like, aha, what's the history of this over here? Mm -hmm. And why is it why is it there? What happened to yeah. what happened and to also here? our isotope makeup is as modern human beings is fundamentally different because of nu the nuclear age. Okay, wait a minute, hold before up before that. Stop. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah. The top, what? Yeah, so because uh, with nuclear blasts, humanity has changed. I think it's the, I and don't fully take my word on before, this. Because before you I, carry on, is it is it possible that what you're about to say will lead to why my brothers that are younger are way taller than me than I am? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> right, I've I've been thinking about all my friends, so we're in the 
Wait, Chernobyl. But we have, uh, I think we've, as humanity, we have, uh, because of our messing around with nuclear uh, power, we have, um, we have changed the background radiation on the planet. And so that means that our compositions are slightly different from, you know, before the first nuclear blasts. Wow. So the entire, yeah. <laughs> the entire populace could have been affected because even though the particles that we can't per se measure, they still travel? Yeah, so I, I don't know how this works exactly because I'm not a nuclear scientist. Um, I, I have very little knowledge about this. This is just- <laughs> you just say read. you should be. You should be. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, I mean... so there, is, there is like, like as, as the entire population on the planet as modern human beings is just slightly different in, in terms of how we are made up of ra radiation and that kind of stuff in, in one way or another, then compared to, um, yeah, five generations ago. Right, which, because all those Snickers bars that they put toxic waste in, I've heard about as a kid. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right, before, before we get too far from uh, okay, the... Sorry. Yeah, we, we, we went from Vikings to nuclear war. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> before before oh, we get, um, I wanted to make one more compliment about The Last Kingdom before we move on to kind of the Vikings in the East and, and see what we can discover about your your homelands, I guess, Arnas. Um, was that I, I didn't, it didn't click until the last two episodes. The, the Last Kingdom has managed to very successfully have very strong female roles without feeling like it's pushed and yes. forced in there, which I think is is a real testament because it's so many other programs and films, and I think Avengers Endgame is the biggest culprit for this, like just get it wrong. And they, they feel the need to put it in there, but they want to just kind of force it in there and especially with Endgame, like they have this moment where it's all the female warriors together in one spot. But it's, but it's dis it, it takes you from disbelief because there's this big battle going on, but they all happen to be there in this one moment and I kind of have this, this moment together and it pulls you out from the movie because you're like, that's not going to happen. She was over there, she was over there. What the fuck's going on? But with The Last Kingdom, it's like they've all ended up in these positions of power and, they're, and you know, the strong... Um, especially like with Stiora. And then you kind of, it doesn't, it doesn't feel unnatural. It's just part of the show. And yeah. that's a, a testament to the writers. I think it's, it's, it's a brilliant thing. Um, and yeah, like I said, I didn't realize until the last two episodes, which kind of shows how good it is. Yeah, I see. I think, I think I'm going to agree, absolutely agree with you here. Because I remember with season five, when we were already, shooting and reading it we were like talking about like look you these are power late power ladies powerhouses powerhouses <laughs> and i think um part of it and i'm guessing i don't know i don't have enough of a track record to have read enough scripts and enough movies to to dissect if this is truth or not but i feel that martha's entrance to the show martha hillier being the the writer for the past couple of seasons i think that added to the the, the, the three-dimensional um, characters that the, the women have become and are, because I don't know if this is true, but sometimes when you look at older products, like films and series, sometimes the things that come out of people's mouths, you're like, oh, okay, you know, they didn't necessarily try as much, or it was just like, yeah, yeah, she said that. Do they mm -hmm. women say that? Okay. So I think a lot of the times the, in the past, there's, there's not enough nuance because you don't have women on the team writing stuff and you can only, yeah, you can imagine as a man or whatever, like, Oh, this is that. And she said this and that is your creative poetic justice or whatever you call it. But I think it's really important to have real humans that can think in both directions to create this nuance. I think, I, I think every man on the planet can attest that we don't have a clue what women are thinking. I'm going to say, <laughs> Nick, we right don't know. <laughs> So Interesting. look, they're already five steps ahead because they're they're intuition. They just there's one thing <laughs> that you're you can discuss or uh, argue about as much as you want, but there's this one thing that they're already born with. I feel like more than we are. This 
intuition of sorts. We're playing checkers and they're playing chess. Oh, mate, we're just like, we're trying <laughs> to carve out. We're playing checkers on a chess board, looking at the letters and numbers and like, what are those? It's a different game. It's a different game. <laughs> I uh, speaking speaking of women historically um just going back to what we talked about as a segue to this i wanted to highlight one thing i don't think that there's been a period in, of time in european history where you don't find a woman on the throne somewhere like just the, wow. yeah think about that for for a second um the way that the way that we think about uh, gender power relations today is very much a product of the early 20th century, mm. which is a very, you know, in terms of diversity of thought, creativity, knowledge, understanding of the world, and so on, the, the early 20th, uh, 20th century is completely impoverished. Like it's, 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 it's such a, like for European thinking, at least it's like, you, you look at that stuff in, in sort of like a broad historical perspective and you go like, what? So is it then what safe the to say that, that perhaps the illusion of the time was that the science is going up so much. We're like creating nuclear this so that the other stuff, people sort of like, yeah, you know, this is, we're moving to the future. And another stuff you like just go backwards. Yeah, absolutely went backwards. I mean, wow. Europeans invented Nazism. Like, come on, that, that's going backwards <laughs> if you ask me, no. right? Or, you know, I, I or just downwards, right? It's not even going backwards because like people people before Nazis were smarter than that. Um, but the, the, my, my point is that, you know, we, we, we see, um, like when, when we look at it in a historical perspective, we see that there's generally in, in one way or another, uh, a bunch of very powerful women, like uh, think about Catherine the Great of Russia, think about, well, Queen Victoria of, of England, like the, the only woman to have ruled or the only person to have ruled uh what is it like 25 percent of the world's population or something like that mm. it's a woman mm. um so like when you think about it in that uh, in that perspective then all of a sudden hey wait a minute that is the, the way that we think about these things today based off of like how we understand the past might actually be our fault more than the past <laughs> wow mind-blowing okay <laughs> Okay. I feel like we need a minute. <laughs> just like we just, need a minute to recenter. Let's like, <laughs> let's all settle ourselves. <laughs> wow. And it, it, by far, some of the most uh, uh, historically and and societally and socially significant uh, uh, people in English history are women, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Queen Elizabeth and Queen Victoria. Pretty. Pretty important uh, he's, figures he's historically. Yeah, yeah. yeah she's the Prince Albert guy who came in and did a couple of beneficial things, but she was like, she was the. I mean, still. Mm -hmm. okay. If you think about it in Scandinavia, the the only the the person who, like, managed to create a Scandinavian empire that included all the Scandinavian countries, which arguably, in terms of geographic landmass, is the biggest empire that has existed in in Europe. Europe so to speak uh -huh. um that was a woman too queen margaret the first of denmark who was well she was first queen of norway and then she also became queen of denmark and then she also ended up becoming queen of, of of sweden and that included finland and greenland and all these wild places right why so do you think, why do you think they had that what what is what do you think is the the power moment in those those particular women is that possible to dissect why would they be such you know. So it, it, in, in different, well, it really depends, right, in, because we're dealing with different time periods. But one thing that you could see with uh, Queen Victoria is that um, she emulates male power a lot. I've read that somewhere that was I was trying to understand so that, that the, que the women that come into power, they still have to sort of pretend they're doing it ma the man way. Well, it, it depends on the structures of the society. So that was her situation, but she was unequivocally the ruler there, nobody questioned that right but if you right. go to Ma queen margaret the uh, first she was questioned a lot uh, she had to rule through her son instead 
So she was de facto the ruler, but everybody was like, yes, we'll talk to your son, who's like nine or something like that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Isn't life ridiculous sometimes? Right? <laughs> so, so, so those are two different, different types of rulers, of course. Um, but then you can, of course, find uh, 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 I, well, Queen Isabella of Spain, I think, was very, very much like, yeah, we don't question her rule. She, she's in charge. Boom. That's just it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's another example. Oh, and, and our, our resident Swede, Frederick, is uh, bitching about the Kalmar Union in, in the chat. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> let, me just, let me just ask one thing, Frederick. It was your own fault. You could have just not invaded Denmark, Norway at the time, and then you wouldn't have gotten your asses kicked. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think my taxi is here, guys. I think I'll. Uh... <laughs> no, I, I mean, do you think that there's a lot of like because it's underestimating them, or underestimating women that would make these situations kind of arise? Um, kind of probably like underestimating them and then that driving a more focused person and a more determined person to to kind of take the take more and push harder and, and be more successful yeah i mean I like what matthias said was also interesting that it's just the 20th century but the perspective changed a little bit and we we look we started looking at it differently right i mean sorry i, I feel i feel i feel that that is happening historically so what you see from somewhere in the middle of the 19th century and and towards the middle of the 20th century is sort of like this time period where we war, uh, like in in european thinking obviously you're, you're you're getting more and more constrictive this is also when like religious puritanism becomes you know socially very dominant and 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 this is this is where this is where you have this um a, I would call it a poverty of thought, essentially. Like people, people get get lazy about the, the thinking about what what the world could be, and and then you have to like reinvent everything after after World War II in Europe and 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 the Americas for that matter. And so, are you saying that it's up that it's up to some sort of leaders or whatever out of of a specific historical time? to keep everyone engaged enough with what's going on as if it's a show so that they would like the show and keep on working. No, I'm, I, I, I'm saying it's up to all of us to actually be actively engaged in thinking differently about our existence. Mm. Like if you want to get some philosophical about it, I like think we should, <laughs> we should all like put our minds to, to thinking differently about how, what the world could be and what life could be in general like we we don't need to walk around doing the things that we do right now we can we can add things we can take things away from that we can you know be creative about what we actually want in life if that makes sense absolutely i think i i think i understand you and what about <laughs> i'm always fascinated with um connecting the ancient wisdom with with today because what you said previously that we have a tendency like oh we're the smartest we figured it out we have iphones you know whatever but then we keep like all this wisdom from the past comes in and we just because we live in this time like oh no no that was crap you know like kind of the world existed for so long i mean they must have known something that they mm -hmm. survived so what do you think how do you amalgamate the past wisdom into the today and what are the things that we should about you know this is this is why i came into this line of work in the first place because i was like there's some really solid wisdom to be gained from knowing and understanding past cultures across the planet um i mean it's isn't it interesting to consider that you know the mayans knew of the wheel that they had invented the wheel but they never used it for anything but toys what yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. What? And you, and you're like, what? Wait, what? <laughs> and that has got to be because of the way their way of thinking about moving around in the world. They they must have they must have been like, okay, shrug, whatever. Uh, maybe we just don't need that. <laughs> they always had this like, 
what are you playing with that fidget spinner? To leave it alone, whatever. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then you have a then you have other cultures like in in Europe and in Asia that build their entire existence around roads, right? right. Like, so so the, the, this just tells you that if you think about how people have thought about things in the past, it, it gets it get it can get really 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 mind blowing, <laughs> like. Right. And um, I find it incredibly fascinating um, that you have a, because in European history, when we as historians talk about the evolution of, of European societies, we highlight the wheel as a really important invention, right? right. And it's like, oh, the wheel was invented, uh, what was it, in Sumer or something like Mary, that. Very, thousand uh, years ago. Yeah, 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 blah, 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 <laughs> you know. And then, you know, the, um, it, and it, it, that is also because, you know, the, the invention of the wheel sp spills over to the water mill right, which becomes one of the first machines that can work on its own. And that then in European thinking is like, ah, well, that's the key to industrialization, right? When we can have wheels turning, I mean, we have it in our language too, right? We talk about the wheels of spinning, the wheels of turning and all that stuff, right? right. Then, then that becomes like a significant historical moment for European society and its development, right? And this is what we as Europeans and so, well, this is what made us so awesome that we could go and conquer the world, blah, 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 right? But it's like, yeah, but was that a good thing? No, I don't think so, man. <laughs> <laughs> I've read somewhere that a lot of this conquering and inventing came into in, in places of the world where uh, it was a lot colder than other places. Because, mm -hmm. I, because I've read, I think it was in Germs, Guns and Steel or something like that, mm -hmm. um, that places where it was super warm you don't need to necessarily invent stuff because you're constantly well it's warm you're not cold you don't need to create you know shelter or whatnot so a lot of that expansionism came from people just being cold <laughs> i mean uh, 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 you've got, uh, you've got <laughs> the fist on us <laughs> well so i had I, 45 I, minutes I, guys i had a good 45 <laughs> minutes <laughs> <laughs> no, so, so it, it, this is a good question because there are, you know, um, uh, this has been a long discussion in, in among anthropologists and historians, like, what is it that is like sort of like the key igniting thing that, that, that sparks that, you know, uh, social evolution and technological developments and all that stuff. I think uh, the problem with that way of thinking is that it's, you know, centered around, again, Europe. And the right. idea that 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 Europeans are special. Um, oh, and I, know. If, I, was, I, was, I hope I wasn't. I didn't come across as saying that. No, 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 no not no, at all. You're at you're all. you're referencing this particular book that has a <laughs> you know it has a particular perspective on all of this germs, guns, and steel, right? Um, the the um, the, the, the the problem with that theory is that a lot of those inventions that you, Europeans are using, right, to be competitive out there in the world they come from from other places in europe like for instance gunpowder um right. and uh, or the wheel for that matter we, the europeans didn't invent the wheel they 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 they, they went is there anything that the europeans actually invented that was like yeah existential <laughs> dread <wasn't> stolen <laughs> existential what existential dread oh. uh, philosophers <laughs> si sitting around <laughs> Like, look at all well, the German philosophers. Can you put it in your French mouth? Can you wear it? Nope. But it's here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, you got to give Europeans credit for inventing a bunch of things, of course. Um, but but it, what I, my point is just that there's a lot more synergy to it than you saying that, oh, because of a certain environment, you get particularly competitive people um because that's not really the case like there, there's a bunch of a compounding factors right where you're like you can't single one thing out and then say oh this is why this is why these people were okay. capable of doing this like the potato is a really important component in uh, european migrations too that, is that what you said is an important it is a very important component because the potato as soon as like you have europeans going to the americas getting potatoes then they go grow them 
in England and Germany and elsewhere. And then all of a sudden you have population explosions because the potato is a very nutritious, uh, uh, what do you call that? Um, thing from the ground. <laughs> um, uh, something. It's not a grain, it's not a fruit. What is it? Come on, Dan, you know English. Oh my right? God, root, root. Root, uh, root, vegetable. root vegetable. Yes, right? it's a It's a really important root vegetable, a uh, very nutritious root vegetable, right? And that's also why um, once there is a, a disease that starts taking hold of those potatoes, that's when you get the so-called Irish famine, which was actually a European famine. We just really? only know it as an Irish famine because there's a lot of Irish who left for the Americas because of the famine, right? Mm -hmm. But you have a considerable famine in Central Europe for the same reason, because you have this disease that is spreading among the potatoes. So point being is that the potato was also an incredible uh, path or uh, part of the path for Europeans to have a population explosion that then enables them to go out and be assholes to other people around <laughs> the world, right? Blame the potato. So, all right, I haven't spoken about potatoes. Who's going to clean life? the dishes? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Wow. <laughs> should we, should we, we, I know we, you what, you have about 50 minutes, Anas, before you? Oh, yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, guys, this is mind-blowing, but I do have, uh, do have 50 You're, minutes. Yeah. You're I wanted to ask you something, time. actually, speaking of potatoes, Arnas, is, is Lithuania a potato country or is it a Catholic I think, country? I think I would say very much so. Whenever I'm mm -hmm. around Irish people, I'm like, oh, we're potato. There's like, no, we're, I'm like, okay, well, historically, you're, you're right, probably. But we love potatoes. <laughs> we have a strong relationship with it. We have a lot of different versions of different things you can make out of them. But uh, I personally have drifted away a little bit from them in the past few years. But we Lithuania and potatoes. Hey, yeah, it's it's like Denmark. I think, with it's, that. I think it's in our in our anthem somewhere. Potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's not awesome. I've got, I was gonna say I've seen I've seen pictures of you without a shirt on. You're not getting like that <laughs> eating too many potatoes. No, mate, that's all I have is like I keep, keep eating the starch and you're like, Phew. so then you can't eat for a couple of days because there's too much starch. So then you end up fasting for numerous days. So again, potatoes is good. Mm -hmm. It's good for you. Um, you know what? I, I don't want to force us onto a topic. We're not going to get very far in. Um, so honestly, I mean, if you fancy coming back in the future, we can. I absolutely. I absolutely. We, we can. We can, can definitely. Then, but let's create. But let's create mystery. Let's say next week, and then oh no, he can't. No, no, yeah, it'll be like two <laughs> years time. But, but I think I think that's going to be the the easiest way that we can really get into. And then the next, the next fifteen minutes, who the fuck knows what's going to happen? Who knows where we're going to go? But let's let's enjoy the next fifteen minutes, and then in the future, whenever we get you back, we will we will look at the. The Vikings absolutely. in the East. I absolutely yeah. am privileged for, and I'm, I'm, I'm up for that because this, again, like you just said, I had a numerous, numerous moments of exploding. <laughs> it's good. It's good to see though. I, it, it you, makes you me guys feel are inflating like my ego, man. <laughs> Listen, we're going to drop it back down as soon we lift it up and then we take it back down. Don't worry about it. So you just keep your eyes open. <laughs> you enjoy keep, whilst you're there. Keep your ego, keep your ego close. Cause once we smack, oh, <laughs> we need to find a weakness first uh, can i ask something about um then we're talking to we have a couple more minutes for this i want to know about you see i'm very interested in it i don't say i wouldn't say dieting but in ways of operating with food intake and whatnot i'm very curious how how did the vikings live because i from what i understand very little is that people back People are always a bit hungry and a bit cold. And mm. that's what kept them moving, right? Is that I, I think I think to an extent you definitely see uh people in that general, not just Scandinavia, but the entire Baltic Sea area. A little, little hungry and a little cold, absolutely. Um Especially depending on whether or not you have a, uh, a a long Russian winter or or more of a mild Atlantic winter, um, I mean that's still the weather patterns for Scandinavia today. Um, you know, they, they, you 
the the western parts of Scandinavia pretty uh, relatively mild considering how far north they are mm. and that's because of the Atlantic but then once in a while the Atlantic gets broken or the Atlantic winds get broken by that you know cold that comes from the central Russian area and um I think what you could see in the Viking Age are if you if you look at weather patterns, if it's possible to to sort of map that out, you probably see um, movements based a little bit on that. Uh, not I, I'm I'm not going to say that that's the only thing that causes like the Viking yeah, Age. What I love what you definitely... said previously is that there's constantly in, in history there's these compounds that like boom a potato comes in, boom everything's changed, and then something little another thing happens, and then there's mm -hmm. something else. Mm -hmm. So. I'm very fascinated by like, and you've opened up my mind to it today because I also, I think I'm at fault of uh, having tendencies to think in ways of like, what are the 10 rules to a whatever successful business? What are the 10 things that the Vikings did to this and that? And it's right. more, it's just constant nuances that change. We always want to simplify, right? Like when, right. That's what we, I always say that's what we say on here so many times that everyone wants to put everything in these little, neat boxes and pack them away on the shelves and say this is this is exactly this and then forget about it when everything really is just a it's complicated honest that's I noticed I, i've noticed the comments were like it's complicated that, it's that's complicated. like that's like that's <laughs> our official motto i guess now is the, the at this point early on in the show i think like you know Matthias changed everything i i thought i knew about the vikings and it i think every week i was like fuck it's just really complicated so it stuck it stuck around somebody yeah. I, I, when i gave the first question about women this and that and then i was like and somebody just started flooding it is complicated it's complicated <laughs> I'm like, okay i feel like this is a theme here it is very much it a is. theme <laughs> it is. and uh, to, to just answer your question about dieting uh, or diets um in the viking age because that's also very complicated you're dealing with a landmass or land masses essentially that that are very diverse right um southern scandinavia is you know relatively fertile compared to central scandinavia northern scandinavia in particular yeah. which means that the that the at least fertile for for agriculture um you know in northern scandinavia you have plenty of other resources when you're hunting or herding reindeer and so on so that means that the diet also change and what you can see for instance in iceland is that it very quickly becomes very fish based uh and that's because you know as floki realized when he sailed to Iceland, and i'm not talking about the guy from vikings i'm talking about the historical guy Floki. he sailed to iceland with his cattle and then he realized oh there's like a bunch of fish in the streams and there's like things i can hunt and so he was doing that all summer and then he didn't you know, gather enough feed for his cattle so they all died in the winter and he was like i'm leaving and I'm calling this place <laughs> Iceland. <laughs> the story of Iceland. Ah! That's, I mean, you can see why. You can see why. <laughs> um, Anas, you know, we've got you, we've got you for a few more minutes. Uh, we are right just to throw a few sort of patron Dude. questions at you. The, knowing our patrons, they're not going to be anything to do with the topic. They're going to be completely random. But let's just let's fire Dude. through a few of these. Um, so if you wanted to know if you have a Hogwarts house or if you were... Which, which house in Hogwarts would you be? <laughs> which one has the best donuts? I don't know. Are you, are, you a fan, are you a fan of Harry Potter? I am a fan. Do you know what? The terrible thing, and that's I think that's my own personal issue. I finished all the books, and that happens with more than one show and movie. I watch the thing, and I just don't watch the very last episode. I don't know for what, but I haven't seen the very last Harry Potter. I've read them all, but I haven't seen the very, very last one. I don't know why. Interesting. I, the, I, don't, I wouldn't like to be in the snake one. I don't know. But they, they, they drew it. They created that you just want to hate them. Maybe there's some nice people in there, but we're just like, yeah, they're bad. Maybe. Yeah. So, uh, I, I don't know which you'd be. I'd, I'd like to just be in a, like a group of people that are uh, pretty empathetic that I could learn from them and they wouldn't, they would judge me when they wouldn't judge me too hard when I failed because I, I turned a lot of stuff into actual shit probably with the magic wand thing. So <laughs> I'd love a group of people that'd be like, ah, okay. It's just oh, I mean, to be fair, I think the chat is very much saying that you are a Hufflepuff. Hufflepuff. 
Hufflepuff, that stuff. I feel what like puff? what do the Hufflepuffs puff? Ooh. Yeah, I feel like everyone, yeah, everyone's decided for you. Um, all right, Nadia wanted to know what have you learned about yourself from playing Citric? Is there anything that you've kind of picked out on, I guess, playing that role? I think that's something that people kept uh, coming back to, like, oh, we want him to, for more lines, this and that. And over time, I, as, a, as an artist, I was like, I should talk more or something. But I, what I've learned, and that was very important, I think, in the past year, that I just need to listen more. Mm-hmm. Just need to listen more. Because there's a... Just in this case as well, I caught myself numerous times. Like I'm here to learn, but I'm like, just shut up, listen. So I feel like that's one lesson. I think that's a lesson for everybody out there. Just, just sometimes listen. just listen a bit more. Just listen, and and um, I think, I think especially in this last last stretch of it, I think there's a very interesting lesson that we've, me and Mark, we both learned about being supporting our artists, supporting actors, not not being the number one one. But I feel like there's an art of of how do you open up your num- you know you're just because mm-hmm. you're all telling your stories but you you're trying to elevate this so yeah. I think I hope I'd like to think that I've learned a bit of selflessness I'd like to think it's it's only other people can tell me that and the track record itself can tell but I'd like to think that and uh, a bunch of cool stunts I've yeah. learned so many like things that I come on to new jobs and they're like Oh, okay. And only because I've been on the show for so long, I never think about it that way because you're constantly a student, just like here. As long as you learn, you learn, you learn. And then you step out and people are like, wow, you can do that? And you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. That. Perfect. Perfect answer. So Marissa is trying to get us the, um, the click beta headline here. So who's your, who's your favorite Last Kingdom character? So <laughs> you're trying to divide the opinions. Ooh, it's very, very hard to say, like to have like one, one person that stands out. I remember that back when that character was still alive, I, I always wanted to see Ethelwald. I really wanted to see him because that she just dislike him so much, mm-hmm. you know, but because his performance is so good. I don't know. I think I'd, I'd lean... Ethelwald and and uh, Ellsworth, it's just just mm-hmm. because the level. Just to think about, just to think about Eliza's journey as an actor f- throughout all the seasons, everybody hated her, and people don't don't separate an actor and a character. People don't separate that. So she, the people would hate on her, and then in the last season, she's like boom, gets this redemption, and all of a sudden, she's everyone's favorite, and mm-hmm. I like that. Uh, I think that's an interesting psychological observation about humans in general. I think so. There you go. Kind of scary that people don't separate, like yeah, like that actor. kid, like that kid of Game of Thrones who was the 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 guy who was season four. I can't remember. I haven't watched it. So you come back to Ireland and people are throwing bricks at him. Oh, Ramsay Bolton. Yeah. What? Oh, I mean, he's a he's a he's a naughty boy. But you see, that's the, you know you're talking about. I hate that guy. It's like, yeah. It's a, he's a nice guy, but we like we don't. But that was the same with the the bad guy in the the, the fifth series of um, the Last Kingdom. Like when you when you get the the bad guy who you fucking hate, and it's like if I see you in person, like I'm not gonna like you, and I know it's not you, but I'm not gonna like you. Like that's a that's good it's, writing, and you know you're on. I mean, thing. The, uh, Karate Kid, the 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 bad guy from Karate Kid, right? Right, he's. <laughs> Yeah. Right, <laughs> he's like the example of this. I, lo- I love that they turned that into a story, actually. <laughs> mm-hmm, they did, yeah, Ooh. yeah. So, yeah, no, that's uh, yeah, that's a good point. Should we let's wrap this up? Let's let's get you out of here, Anas. Your, your light's fading, you're disappearing, <laughs> <laughs> guys. Can I, from my from my end, I'd like to really, really thank you because I, I was coming in today. I, I was preparing that, yes, I'm going to learn, but both of you, Matthias, you're a very, very fascinating man. And uh, I can't you. wait to, to, to come back and get my mind blown a lot more. Dan, no more props. We've got, you got them. 
you got the best. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for organizing this. And I, I like the way Mateus got you're a fascinating man, and I got no more props. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what you're doing to me. I thought we were friends. We've been talking yeah, for like three the, years. I started the podcast from saying all just the nice things to you. It's like if I fin- if I end on the same note, that would just be, be bad storytelling. Mm-hmm. All right, <laughs> it's got a point. <laughs> all right <laughs> thank you so much for joining us Adonis. this was great fun <laughs> thank you very much um obviously you don't need our help but shout out your your instagram or anywhere that listen you'll be able to check out just keep, keep following these guys and i'll be around so you'll find me as arnas fetterman but uh but just keep following these guys and let's 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 get back here soon and and learn some more all right perfect so like all that. right Go to, it's a bit dark, but again, Horns of Odin. This is my favorite shirt. Uh, I have a bunch of these and horns. So please go get, well, maybe we'll do a collab of some sort in the future. I don't know. We'll see. We should. We should. God bless you all, guys. Definitely. All right. If you if you enjoy the show, please leave us a five-star rate and positive review wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you want to watch the show live, and get to ask your questions to people like Arnas. Obviously, next time he's on, we'll do. We're definitely going to have to do a, a Q and A again. Um, yeah, just follow the Patreon. It's just Patreon for such Naughty Mythology podcast. Mateus, where can people find you? Yeah, you can. You can still find me on Instagram. It's for now. It's not pretty, but I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> and you can find me Daniel and Scott and one or obviously at Horns of Verde. Arnas, thank you very much. This was everything that I hoped it would be. Um, you know, we've been we've been speaking for a while and we've been trying to set this up and I knew I knew when when it happened, it would be golden. And I think that's I think that's what we got. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, everyone, for turning up and uh, just keep being where you're being. God bless you. All right, man. Take it easy. Thanks. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.